It's good to be back in Moscow. Uh, I was here in November for a Twitter conference. Um, and uh, <coughs> I look forward to coming back to Moscow sometime in the very near future. And I appreciate the invitation to talk. And if you've read through the abstract, uh, you'll see that there, there are some changes of uh, my uh, talk today. But before I really get into the issue of infant mortality in the world system, which is a very big uh, issue, of course, I want to talk a little bit uh, briefly about what I'm interested in, my current research focus. And then I want to talk about two issues that I haven't heard too much about at the conference. Uh, one is gender. The issue has come up a couple of times, but it seems like only in passing. But something I haven't heard one word about is the whole issue of the environment, the impacts of humans on the environment and the impact of the environment on humans. And I think this is uh, uh, a very important issue and, and might inform some of the uh, papers that we heard earlier. Uh, my research focus in three bulleted points can best be summarized uh, on the slide there. How does globalization promote environmental injustice and environmental privilege? as it uh, increased serial theft of ecological space. Secondly, what are the human causes, adverse consequences, and human responses to environmental problems in several specific geographic temporal locations uh, or sites of environmental history, as I like to think about them. I uh, spent a lot of time uh, in Vietnam, China, along the border between Mexico and the United States, and then in the Great Plains of the United States. Some of you probably are familiar with the Great Plains. Uh, these are locations, environmental locations, that I'm particularly interested in. Um, the third point here, which is really the larger question of what I'll be talking about today in terms of infant mortality. What is development, and why do alternative forms of development vary so dramatically within and in between countries? Of course, if a mortality, which I'll come back to in a moment, is one, I think, very good measure of the development of a country. Um, that is, lower in mortality rates, a high survival rate in other words. Now, as I said, I'm going to be a little unconventional here and, and sort of incorporate things. As I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, today, actually early this morning, I thought, oh, gee, no environment, not much on gender. Let me give a little over. We live in a material world. We all know that, right? But unfortunately, I think a lot of social scientists have um, failed to incorporate the environment in their uh, theoretical structures, in their analyses of cross-national or individual level data, whatever the case may be. Now, setting the context, uh, the world system uh, in the material world. This is a uh, little uh, slide I stole from Chris Chase Dunn a while back. Uh, we have a core, we have a semi-periphery, and we have a periphery in terms of the world system. <coughs> and the world system dynamics are essentially best illustrated, I think, in that diagram, in that pyramid, where you have a core, semi-periphery, periphery, uh, highly developed countries at the top, uh, peripheral countries at the bottom, and you have a movement of energy, materials, and so on from the periphery to the core. I'll come back to that point in just a moment. And again, this is just setting the stage for the infant mortality study. Um, has anyone ever heard of ACID countries? The acronym ACID? No? Advanced Capitalist Industrial Democracies. These are the core countries. Didn't even get a chuckle. Um, if we think about the world system, we can think about the distribution of various uh, measures of concern, uh, the distribution of economic wealth in the world system. This slide is uh, to scale in terms of economic wealth. And of course, as you can see on the slide, the northern hemisphere countries, uh, the asset countries, the core countries, if you will, are the uh, location of a great deal of the world's wealth. The southern hemisphere is obviously uh, And if we look beyond economic wealth, and we look specifically at environmental impact, and this holds true for such things as the ecological footprint and so on, we see that the core countries, the asset countries, 
are the source of a lot of the environmental impact uh, that takes place in the world. That is the location. Now, let's take something very concrete. We have here, I have here a, two figures uh, regarding the distribution of carbon dioxide across countries, the major countries. Uh, we all know, I think, probably as of 2010, China was producing more carbon dioxide than any other country in the world. Uh, the United States dropped to second. But if you look at the second figure, uh, you see something very interesting. This is the accumulated uh, emissions between 1751 and 2010. So looking at that, you see that the United States is clearly at almost 27% <coughs> of all carbon dioxide emissions from 1751 up to 2010. That's a rather dramatic uh, figure. And you can see some of the other countries there across time. Uh, Europe, UK, 5.6, well, the location of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Germany, Japan, in other words, the countries that are designated as so-called poor countries. Now, if we graph economic affluence with carbon dioxide emissions, we see something very interesting. It's a very strong linear relationship up to a so-called inflection point. Again, affluence causes large amounts of carbon dioxide to be emitted into the atmosphere. And of course, you all know what uh, carbon dioxide does in terms of um, climate change. Now, going back to the dynamics of the so-called world system, I like to think about the world system in the following way. Wealth, and when we think of wealth, we can talk about materials, energy, labor, and so on. And wealth flows from the resource-rich uh, countries, the periphery, to the so-called asset countries, as I call them, resulting in the <coughs> of resource depletion and degradation and the resulting pollution in the periphery of the world system. And we can think of periphery as a resource extraction frontier. Uh, so wealth flows from the bottom to the top, and anti-wealth. Um, anti-wealth is obviously the opposite of wealth, however that might be defined. Uh, entropy, broadly defined. What we're talking about is the appropriation and carrying capacity of waste assimilation by transporting it to the global sinks, the atmosphere, or the sinks of the periphery in the form of hazardous exports. Uh, hazardous industries, uh, hazardous products, and so on. In other words, global sinks and the peripheral zones of the world system are essentially waste disposal frontiers. Now, I like to uh, think about the, uh, the flow of calories from periphery to core. This is sort of an amusing little uh, diagram of the flow of calories between the core and the periphery. This well illustrates what I'm talking about at the individual level. Now, why study infant mortality in the world system? Well, infant mortality, as we know, is a fairly good indicator of uh, development, or at least the infant survival rate is a very good indicator of development. And what we know is that you can change the infant mortality rate fairly easily by just simple public health and other kinds of measures. It's uh, a very sensitive uh, variable, if you will, to certain kinds of things. And again, if you look at the flood of infant mortality in the world system, what do you see? Well, it tends to be higher in the so-called <coughs> peripheral uh, zones of the world system, which probably is no big surprise. Now, the infant mortality problem. 
infant and child mortality rates have declined substantially in the past six decades. I mean substantially. Um, as well as the infant death rate. Across all countries occupying different locations in the world system. And there was a recent article, a very important article in my opinion, published by Wang et al. Wang and I think it's 39 other authors. This is one of the most substantial, sophisticated analyses of infant mortality I have ever seen. And essentially what they were doing is we was trying to estimate um, infant mortality uh, rates going back about 50 years. And they were able to plot, if you will, the decline in infant mortality. Um, 6.3 children under 5 child mortality, um, 6.3 million children died in 2013. That's a 64% reduction from 17.6 million who died in 1970. The annualized rates of change from 1990 through 2013 range from a negative a decline of 6.8% to a slight increase of 0.1%. Now let me show you what that looks like. This is the decline in mortality, child mortality between 1970 and 2013. That's a rather substantial decline. What did I say? Roughly 63% during that time period. Now, if we look at it on an annual basis in terms of uh, reduction, it's, this is a rather interesting curve. Um, up to about 1990, 1995, there is a rapid uh, decline, and then that begins to, uh, to drop in terms of the actual rate of decline. Now, so you have a substantial reduction in child mortality and infant mortality during this time period. But, yes? I'm sorry, can you just one second get back to the previous slide? I couldn't really see the, the second chart. <clears throat> so, the, the, no, the, so the peak decline happened between 1990 and 2005. Yeah, roughly, roughly. There was, there was an increase during that time period. Decrease. In terms of increase in the decline. Okay. Yeah. Does that clarify that point? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> now, despite the substantial decline in uh, mortality, there's still a rather dramatic variation across nations of the world system. And, of course, in the peripheral countries, we find a very high range of mortality relative to the so-called poor countries. And infant mortality rates uh, in 2013 uh, varied from a low of, what, 1.8 death per thousand births in Monaco to a high of 187.1 in Afghanistan. Now, that's data published by the U.S. Uh, Central Intelligence Agency, the U.N., and several of the other uh, data sources that one can use uh, didn't see quite that range. Variation and again, we know why Afghanistan had a fairly high rate or had the highest. Yeah. Now, here's a graphing of infant mortality rates circa 2013. And again, what's the pattern? As I've already stated, the peripheral countries have higher mortality rates, infant mortality rates. Now, the purpose. Why does the infant mortality rate vary so dramatically across nations? There have been various explanations offered, uh, but limited attention has focused on the role of gender. There have been a number of studies that I'll cite in just a moment, but there has not been a systematic effort to fully explore the link between gender equity, equality, and infant survival, or its off opposite infant uh, death. Um, and what I do is fill in this gap in the literature by looking at the relationship between gender and infant mortality in 2012. And this is the most recent data that I've been able to uh, find. I've done uh, a 
series of studies over the last uh, five or six years looking at data for 1995, 2000, 2005, 2010, and now data for 2012. And I hope to update this in the, the near future. Now, gender empowerment. Why does gender appear to be a fairly good predictor of the variation in infant survival? Proponents have argued that women, women's empowerment, and again this can be defined in terms of what autonomy, status, power, freedom, education, and so on, increases infant care and reduces infant deaths. So when you empower women, you increase infant care, or the quality of infant care, and of course reduce infant deaths. In effect, it appears as if women's control of resources and power to make important decisions for their families lead to improved infant care and increases infant survival. Now, there are at least three reasons for the focus on women's empowerment and its relationship with uh, infant mortality. Again, we all know, I think, women are typically responsible for caregiving and ensuring household food security and health. Infant survival probabilities increase when mothers are educated and have access to health care and related information. A second very important reason. Women are more likely to use resources for basic family needs, and if they have control over resources, they are more likely to direct them to education, nutrition, and health. Again, let me repeat that. Women are more likely to use resources for basic family needs, and if they have control over resources, they are more likely to, to direct them to education, nutrition, and health. Now, this statement is based on research that has been carried out in a number of countries over time. And of course, infant survival probabilities will increase when mothers have control over the family resources. Now, when women have greater control over household decision making, so we have information, we have resources, and we have another important component, and that is control over household decision making. When they have control over decision making, they can take better care of themselves and their children. Women with more freedom to make decisions in education are more likely to follow recommended health and nutrition, nutrition practices and use health services when available. Now, I think those are three primary reasons why gender empowerment and infant survival go together. Now, what is the existing research? Well, there have been a number of studies over the years that have looked at various measures of gender equality or inequality, and there is a pattern of support for this argument. Um, Wanju Kui, a former graduate student of mine, uh, have a paper coming out in the Journal of Globalization Studies and some other papers <laughs> that examines um, a variety of different uh, predictors of infant mortality. And this particular study was based on uh, data for 2005 for a large uh, sample of countries found a link, pretty strong link between uh, women's education and infant survival. Uh, there was an important piece uh, done by uh, Burroway in uh, 2015, Women's Rights Save Lives. Um, but again, based on older data. Um, Summer Chandra et al. Uh, published several papers on uh, the link between sanitation, water, and health, and also find that women's, various measures of women's uh, power, if you will, increases in the survival. And I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago a very important uh, article by uh, Wang and 39 other authors uh, that appeared in uh, 
the prestigious uh, journal The Lancet, where they provide a wealth of information and insight. Uh, and then there was a piece done by Richard York, uh, who was an environmental sociologist uh, working at the University of Oregon. He uh, also looked at the role of empowerment and found, again, respective relationship. <coughs> and there's another important piece that came out in the last uh, 2010 also, uh, finding that there is a very strong and significant relationship between various measures of women's uh, empowerment and in the survival. Now, <clears throat> there's been quite a lot of cross-sectional research published in the last well, 30 years. And it's reflected different theoretical orientations, the three major theoretical uh, traditions in at least sociology that a lot of this research has explored is modernization theory, dependency theory, and development state theory. And of course, there have been a, a number of other uh, variables and factors that have been included in various studies, and I'll come back to that when I talk about the, the study I'm reporting today. But modernization theory um, holds, and I think we all know what modernization theory is, whether it's economic, political, and so on. Proponents of modernization theory argue that greater economic development or industrialization uh, reduces infant mortality through improvements in healthcare, nutrition, and the like. And there's a lot of support for this particular perspective. The greater the influence of a nation, the lower the infant mortality rate. Uh, that's a finding that's consistent throughout the literature. And all cross-national studies have incorporated some measure of economic level, uh, whether it's under the rubric of modernization theory or whatever the case may be, and consistent. There are a very small number of studies that have not found that economic development is now, dependency theory. Um, dependency theorists uh, argue that dependent relationships between poor and peripheral countries, uh, lower resource and surplus, excuse me, foster resource and surplus extraction that could be invested in healthcare, education, and so on. Uh, the research results are very mixed, uh, they're contradictory. So there is much less support for the so-called dependency theory when it comes to understanding the cross-national relation of infant mortality. Uh, development state theory. Uh, proponents contend that strong states can act in ways that reduce infant mortality, uh, especially through investment in public health. And that's a uh, variable, some variation of that nature have been used in countless uh, cross-national studies. Uh, and the results are mixed. Uh, some suggest support, and I have yet to see a, a real clear cut pattern uh, in terms of trying to break out which measures of state development uh, theory are related in an expected way with infant mortality. So there's quite a bit of um, inconsistency in that literature. Now, what am I doing here? Well, I'm looking at gender empowerment and I'm looking at these alternative theoretical perspectives and I also included a number of variables that have been reported uh, to be associated with different mortality, income inequality, democracy, and so on. I'll come back to that. Uh, so I'll talk first about the sample, infant mortality rate, the dependent variable, the independent variables, control variables, and then the method of analysis. The sample consists of very large um, uh, <coughs> countries, 144 developed and less developed countries for which data existed uh, in 2012. Uh, the United Nations was the major source of uh, information data. There was a couple of other efforts to uh, build the data set, but uh, the United Nations is the major source of data. Now, of course, infant mortality is the number of children dying in the first year of life 
per 1,000 live births, again, 2012. So this is obviously a cross-sectional analysis, and of course we all know the limitations of cross-sectional uh, studies. Now, the primary independent variable, um, gender empowerment, female education as measured in combined primary, secondary, and tertiary groups enrollment ratio for females. Um, other variables are available, but data do not exist for as many countries as I included in this analysis. So I work with this particular variable. It has its limitations, of course. It's a variable that's been used um, in various ways in, in many of the previous studies. Uh, it's highly uh, correlated with the more uh, uh, nuanced measures of gender empowerment. It seems to be a fairly good measure. I think it's a defensible one. Um, some of the other independent variables that were included in the analysis, uh, GDP per capita, as I mentioned, that's, that's a variable you have to include for theoretical as well as empirical reasons. It's consistently found to be uh, a predictor of infant survival. Uh, and I used, um, I report one um, measure on dependence, the export of primary products um, as a percent of merchandise exports. Um, I looked at several other major <coughs> dependence. They didn't seem to have much of an effect. Um, and some of these other variables, um, well, let me continue on uh, the main uh, independent variables. Public health care as a percent of GDP in 2012 was used to assess state investment. Now to the control variables. I looked at population growth, income inequality for a subsample of countries that were included in this analysis, uh, sub-Saharan African status, uh, political democracy. These variables, uh, with the exception of sub-Saharan African uh, status variable, had actual impact, income inequality, uh, political democracy. Those are two variables that other researchers have found to be uh, predictors of income inequality. I did not find that to be the case uh, in this analysis. Um, but sub-Saharan African status, I included in the final uh, analysis of the report in a few minutes. Um, and it had a rather substantial impact on infant mortality. Uh, analysis, ordinary least squares, regression. Uh, there were several diagnostic procedures, enrolled process estimation techniques were used to assess the stability of the estimates. Uh, estimates were not compromised by uh, collinear or unusual observations, so I don't report them here, just uh, basic analysis. Now, this is a very basic analysis, uh, including GDP, primary exports, female education, public health, sub-Saharan Africa. And with this small number of variables, count for roughly 80% of the total variation in the sample for this time. Um, some conclusions. Well, results suggest strong support for gender um, empowerment. Female, female education had a very strong negative effect on infant mortality. Let's go back and look at that. Again, GDP, um, primary force has little impact. Female education has expected negative effects. Um, public health um, is, a, is an expected direction, but it's not a terribly significant um, effect. And then sub-Saharan Africa status has a fairly substantial impact. Now, so those three primary variables account for what is it, 79 plus uh, percent of variation. Anyway, in the way of uh, some basic conclusions, uh, the results again suggest strong support for the gender empowerment argument. Female education had a strong negative effect. Uh, strong support was found for the modernization perspective as measured by the GNP per capita. Um, but little support was found for the other two perspectives, dependency state degrees, as I mentioned. Sub-Saharan African status proved to be one of the more important predictors.
predictors of the infant mortality rate. Um, future researchers should begin, didn't have begun looking at why the link between sub-Saharan African status and infant mortality. And there are a variety of explanations. Uh, environmental conditions in terms of access to clean water, basic sanitation, um, are primary um, factors. Structural adjustment policies of the World Bank, uh, they have been fairly severe in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, some of the research on um, structural adjustment uh, has found to be um, having some devastating consequences on the various development measures in Sub-Saharan Africa. The legacy of colonialism and the slave trade. Um, I did a very, very preliminary analysis um, and uh, Jared Diamond um, published a uh, published a couple of books over the years, but uh, published a uh, co-edited book in which they were looking at the uh, variation of slave trade in Sub-Saharan Africa, and they came up with some, I think, fairly good estimates of the uh, the extent to which the country was dependent on the slave trade, and including a variable does reduce the impact of the relationship between sub-Saharan African status and infant mortality, suggesting that the degree of engagement in slavery has had some de uh, devastating consequences uh, across time, uh, which should not necessarily be surprising. Uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic, um, Several people have looked at that and have found that that has some impact, but they would not explain away um, totally the uh, subsequent African status. But undoubtedly, additional work should be done on that. Political instability and violence. <coughs> um, I haven't seen anything uh, too much, but a couple of pieces that have looked at this. Uh, these variables, not in the context of sub-Saharan Africa, but in terms of the larger sample, and the results there are kind of mixed. But in the case of Africa, something here in Africa is worth uh, pursuing. And the rapid urbanization and what's called over-urbanization and the growth in slum settlements in many of these countries is in and of itself strongly coupled with access to clean water and basic sanitation. In an earlier analysis, I looked at uh, squatter settlements um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that is, of course, related with infant mortality, uh, positive relationship, other things considered. Um, so these are some of the factors that probably account for why just the, the variable Sub-Saharan African status has a rather substantial impact on uh, the infant mortality rate. You recall. One of the maps that I had, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of infant mortality on that map. Uh, extend research on gender empowerment. Um, I think this is uh, requires additional work. Uh, there are data out there on women's control of land, property, loans, and so on. It'd be interesting to begin looking at these kinds of variables as measures, alternative measures of um, gender empowerment. Um, the single best and most rational means for reducing infant mortality is to increase women's access to education. Um, and again, we know what's going on around the world <coughs> with respect to access to education by, for women. And it is, uh, in some places, a difficult thing to pursue. But based on these results, the results of a number of other uh, studies, it's very clear that education for women is one of the primary factors. This is controlling for uh, gross domestic product and other measures of economic output, as well as a number of other variables. This relationship is robust. And I should also point out that the world system, as we know it, is gendered. And of course, uh, the status of women in so-called peripheral countries is much less than it is in uh, counterparts.
parts of poor countries, despite issues in uh, poor countries. And again, I'll conclude with Burloway's uh, title, Women's Rights Save Lives. And I guess that's the takeaway <coughs> of my talk, is that if we really want to improve uh, one of the basic indicators of development, we can do so through funding and enhancing the empowerment of women throughout the world. So, let me conclude with that. There should be some time for discussion. There is. Scott, thank you for a very good Well, Ed, you have been a first and so well in name of a fraction of a second. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. Quite interesting. I uh, have um, some problems with um, the analysis, though, because you take uh, uh, female education as a measure of uh, female empowerment, and uh, essentially correlated with um, infant mortality at one point in time. Right. And therefore, uh, technically, you are not sure uh, about the direction of causation. And one could argue. I think uh, quite persuasively that the direction of causation is in fact the opposite because uh, when infant mortality historically drops, after a certain interval of time, what we observe in many countries is the drop in birth rates. And uh, when that happens, then the position of women really changes because she stops being uh, a baby maker, sorry, uh, but uh, uh, rather uh, becomes a, a full-fledged human being capable of uh, uh, doing things that men used to do, uh, winning bread, uh, pursuing education, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, I would uh, try to control by historical birth rates in, in, in your models. But better still, I would try and do a time series uh, and then use some dynamic models, simultaneous regression, such as simulated related regression, uh, structural regression models with cross length effects, and, that, and those would allow you to directly test the direction of. Okay, uh, Francesco, you were second, and then you. Thank you very much, Scott. I partly echo uh, the remark by. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not using words. I'm not using words. Edward Ponani, good. Nice speaking. Uh, I partly echo, but my point is more theoretical because I find it weird that you speak about women empowerment and at the same time they are empowered to stay around the fireplace. So this is a bit uh, weird. If you want to empower them, you want to order them equal rights, equal participation to the work, to, to the work market. So probably it's something else that affects infant mortality and that goes beyond women empowerment. Because if women participate equally to the job market, then uh, the care of children should become something that both parents do. So there is something that theoretically doesn't uh, work for me. There is another aspect that I didn't fully understand. It is how you switch from the global, uh, let's say, environmental crisis to the relationship between women and poverty and infant mortality. And last point, very quickly on the model, you are correlating uh, some levels, like uh, GDP per capita, for instance. But why not uh, checking the growth rate of GDP or the growth rate of public expenditures in health? Because I am not surprised that uh, in levels, richer countries have lower infant mortality. The question is whether higher GDP, higher public expenditure in health, with decreasing infant mortality. And I'm afraid that then we will find some interesting non-linearities. Thank you. I think I, I would just like to add some, some few comments. Uh, uh, you 
You mentioned uh, uh, HIV AIDS uh, as an important factor, and uh, it is indeed uh, written in a lot of demographic works uh, uh, that uh, uh, for sub-Saharan Af Africa, uh, the high prevalence of HIV uh, uh, AIDS uh, epidemic uh, indeed uh, inhibits uh, decline in mortality. So it is, uh, as I, I already read about it, so it is, I would just suggest add it as, an, uh, as a variable uh, for, for the model. Uh, and uh, about, um, you also mentioned three reasons for women empowerment. But uh, I would like to just to, to mention that uh, uh, it is basic, it, in fact, it is basically a demographic transition theory, which was, uh, uh, which is in development already for 70 years, uh, and it was uh, created uh, uh, in uh, 1945 uh, with uh, almost the same statements uh, uh, about uh, how women's roles change uh, after uh, mortality declined and uh, uh, which uh, role that does it play, uh, does it um, play in. Uh, uh, all these uh, changes. Uh, so, um, and um, uh, I, uh, the, uh, Edward just said everything I, I wanted to say to say about causality. Uh, and but uh, I would like just to add that uh, um, not only hu uh, women empowerment uh, can uh, correlate, uh, can has a reverse uh, uh, causality with uh, mortality reduction, but also economic development. Because it it's also can be a result uh, uh, quite often uh, res a result of uh, mortality decline, uh, be um, as, uh, as as pointed out in demographic transition theory, that uh, mortality uh, decline um, starts uh, uh, decline in fertility and then it results in uh, economic growth. Thank you. Thank you. So like articulated by, uh, by Edmonton and by uh, Francesco. I mean, like uh, doing some time series analysis uh, to, to tease out causality. But the second observation was, was Francesco's, like what about the department of the father? The fact that, uh, that raising up children should, I mean, it's normally also like a task for, for fathers as well. What about empowerment of the fathers and their role in the family? Um, what, what do you think about that? Could you huh? restate that? I, I the role of the father, empowerment of the father, the fact that uh, they also increasingly uh, take care of, uh, of, uh, of child's upbringing. Like, um, if you could model that as well, and, and what kind of explanations can be uh, can be attributed uh, for that? Ron, do you want to say something? No, I just was going on. I'm just uh, was thinking about infant mortality in Asian countries. Uh, we know that it is uh, a huge decline, but what is the picture in Asian and sub-Saharan countries with infant mortality? And whether there is a, a difference and how it looks like in Asian, in Asian countries? Because uh, I work uh, more on Europe, and <laughs> would like to know something about Asian countries and how it changes. Yes. Andre, and then I think we better give Scott a chance to respond to this uh, barrage. Um, my first comment uh, so it would be interesting to see the structure of uh, causes for infant mortality. So, well, what they die from? I mean, malnutrition, violence, uh, infections, inf infections, so what kind of infections like HIV, AIDS, uh, digesting, or what? what Malaria, so whatever, just to just to see what uh, what, what policymaking policymakers can target uh, in their policies. Then uh, I'm wondering uh, to what extent education, public health, levels are uncorrelated, meaning that so they are like parts of uh, social expenditures. And uh, so can we talk about multicommunality here? That both when we talk about women's uh, education and public health, so basically it's expenditures on education and expenditures on uh, public health. And uh, about your variables uh, that capture state capacity, I just, just came up to my mind uh, some small part from the book by Thomas Piketty, uh, where he argued that uh, it was globalization and especially great globalization that negative affected the development of uh, uh, for countries because it uh, re 
reduced uh, import tariffs. And for the states, it's, uh, especially for developing states, it's very important, sometimes crucial source of budget revenues because basically they are unable to collect taxes in the way that the developed countries do. And therefore, they are faced with their like, uh, smaller taxes share that they uh, can collect. And therefore, so they can't reduce uh, uh, funding of, let's say, police, military, uh, state, uh, state officials, basic infrastructure. And therefore, in this case, they have to reduce the expenditures on uh, like social welfare, especially education and uh, uh, public health. And therefore, so uh, the suggestion would be uh, to look at the share of taxes collected as a share of GDP and also uh, trade openness, not only experts of primary goods, but also maybe uh, some of experts in imports. Okay. Scott, you've had quite a number of insightful comments. I'd like to hear Reactions. Okay, well, I'll try and handle all of them in one form or another. Maybe the very specific ones I won't be able to. Well, let me begin with the, uh, the statement, or I guess it was a question, uh, the question of how is the first part of what you talked about in terms of this global picture, what does that have to do with your infant mortality um, analysis? Um, I was simply trying to provide a context in terms of where I'm coming from in terms of my own research. Uh, I got to put the slide back up on in terms of the three research areas. Now the reason I decided to incorporate this into my discussion today is because I have not heard anyone mention the word environment and that it might have something to do with human well-being or institutional well-being, or whatever terms we may want to use. So this was just simply, hey look, we got this thing called the environment. Um, and to go back to my point here on this slide, these are the three areas in which I uh, center my attention, uh, teaching and research. And the last uh, question there um, in terms of what is development and why do alternative forms of development vary you know, dramatically across uh, different locations in the world system is clearly what I'm talking about today in terms of the infant mortality. Um, so, in a way, it's not directly linked, but I'm simply trying to provide a context, I think, globally. Um, and I've been hearing a lot of people um, talking about research, good research, uh, individual values and, and so on. And of course there are different ways to address this whole question of, of human well-being or development or whatever the case may be, down to the individual level up to uh, the world systems level. So I see this uh, particular uh, small study on infant mortality as looking at mortality in the world system, uh, so to speak. Um, now, on to some, I hope that clarifies a little bit. The uh, question raised by, uh, by the word um, causation. This is always a problem in these kinds of analyses, especially with cross-sectional data. Um, I have been looking at uh, some uh, light panel models that have data from 2000. 95, 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2012. 12. And so we can start looking at lag, uh, uh, lag models. Uh, and of course the data are not there for real serious, hardcore, time series kinds of analysis at this point. Um, I would only point out that my results are very consistent with what others have reported. Uh, for different time periods. Um, some cases people have used lag models and so on. So the results are very consistent with what others have reported. Different settings, different samples, different time periods, different kinds of um, analyses, and so on. Uh, but in the end, when we're using cross-sectional designs, we're not proving causality. Uh, the relationships are 
there's a pattern there, a clear pattern, which is consistent with the literature. Um, now, in terms of um, including other kinds of variables, uh, better measures, uh, including things such as historical birth rates and a, a number of other factors, I have not done that. These are alternative explanations that need to be addressed in order to have some semblance of clear-cut uh, results that approximate some sort of causal structure. Um, I was, several people mentioned uh, uh, gender empowerment, and perhaps I misunderstood a couple of the comments. If I did, I'm sure that you will, uh, will correct me. But I thought I heard on a couple of occasions that increasing the empowerment of women would in some way reduce care of children. Um, I didn't quite catch that. I think there's a very consistent body of literature for less developed and developed countries that women are the primary caregivers, whether they work in the home or outside of the home, they are the primary caregivers. And they have a very different orientation to uh, reproducing the family in terms of the children. There's a very, very strong body of research suggesting that. And so my thought is if you empower women, then you will see an improvement in, um, in infant survival. I don't know if, does that really uh, address what was uh, stated by several people? Like, or maybe I misunderstood your comment. No, probably we disagree on what human empowerment means. Well, that's, that's true. Uh, very true. There is no doubt that uh, women are responsible for, uh, are more responsible than men when it comes to raising children. This is uh, the bet by Mohammed Yunus. By giving little amount of money to women, he managed to raise the condition of the households because women were more reliable than men. But uh, this is a form of empowerment <coughs> of women, meaning making the women independent from the men, making the women able to make an to build an enterprise. But here you're speaking about uh, uh, giving education to women, and I think what you meant was to make you women. Uh, equal, having the same rights and opportunities as of men, which means making women free to participate to the job market as the men. And this, in my opinion, should take the women out from the, from the house, which means that uh, women become a matter of women, <coughs> not only women. Yes, and taking the men inside the house. Exactly. So, raising children becomes a matter of both parents and not only of the mother. Yeah. Otherwise, what you're doing by raising education of women but leaving them there is making women able to lead the Dostoevsky, but at all. No, I'm not sure that the research suggests that. Sorry? I'm not sure the research actually suggests that. I think the research, as I understand it, is very clearly stated that in the highly developed countries, women are still, regardless of whether they're working, uh, in the of the homes, is still, still the primary caregivers. <coughs> and so what I'm saying, and I agree with your comment, what do we mean by empowerment of women? I think we're talking about um, information uh, regarding nutrition and health and so on, which comes with education and other sources. Uh, control over resources. And the control over resources is very important because we know that women, the research suggests that women will take resources and invest it in a family in ways that men normally will not do. Of course, there are exceptions to that. Uh, and thirdly, the whole issue of decision making. Uh, when women have more control in decision making, they're going to divert uh, resources, be they material or non-material, to children. I think research suggests that. Now, obviously, I'm I'm uh, 
viewing general time in, in those three ways. Um, now, what I'm really interested in, what if we start looking at rights when it comes to land uh, and other kinds of things, different kinds of measures that we begin to tap into more of what I'm arguing here. Education is, is a small part of this. I think there are other uh, primary things, again, uh, rights to the land and, and, and property and so on and so forth. Okay, um, any additional comments? Thank you very much for a very stimulating discussion.